Well, let me get started. I'm happy to do that. And I'm so glad to see so many folks with us today um, and others will be joining. So um, anyway, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Dantmont and, um, and for those of you who don't know him, it looks like many know and love him. Um, John Dantremont, Randolph College's Theodore H. Jack, professor of history, originally planned to be a journalist. After graduating from the University of Virginia in 1972, he went to work as a typist for the United Press International. Yearning for more action, he eventually left to join the state campaign staff in Richmond for George McGovern's presidential run. He loved the work, though it was exhausting, and left him drained at the end of each day. But he'd always find time to read from one of his history books before drifting off to sleep. He shares, I'd liked history for a long time, had majored in it in college, and was convinced of its value. But those late nighttime hours during the campaign deepened my regard and affection for it. The campaign was all action with little time for extended reflection and meditation. But the historians I was reading had time to ponder, to think, to fully assess their evidence and refine their conclusions. I envied that, he said, I envied them. So Dr. Dontremont began applying to grad schools. He earned his PhD at Johns Hopkins University and the rest, as they say, is history. He joined the faculty at Randolph in 1980 and is retiring this year after 41 years at the college. I am truly honored to introduce John Dontremont, who will tell us more about John Randolph and the field of honor. John, welcome and thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, yes, the rest is history. Uh, and it's a history that as we've already seen before we got started, uh, yet many of you were a part of, and the history of the last 41 years would not have been the same, needless to say, without you. And um, I, I, I am very serious when I say you have no idea um, how much this has meant to me, knowing you, um, and how much you influenced my life um, for the better. And I thank you very, very much. Now, um, today, I'm going to talk about John Randolph, uh, the name on the sweatshirts, the name on the signs on either end of the 2500 block of Rivermont Avenue in Lynchburg. And I'm going to uh, talk about the guy that um, when, when somebody asks you, so who is that college named for? Whether it's Randolph-Macon Women's College or Randolph College. And um, you're, I don't know what you answer. <laughs> you can tell me at the end here, but but um, the real answer, the only honest answer, Anya, uh, is to borrow from Facebook. It's complicated uh, because um, the college was, this college, your college, was not named for John Randolph or Nathaniel Macon. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a, a name that was uh, automatically conveyed to Randolph Macon Women's College in the 1890s when it became the coordinate college of Randolph-Macon College in Ashland. I, and as you probably know, uh, the college began as Randolph-Macon College in the little teeny town of Boydton, Virginia, near the North Carolina line in the early 1830s. And so now, um, hold your breath, I am going to attempt to uh, start presenting to you. As I told Phoebe and Lauren at the beginning, this is my baptism since we use Google Meet in our classes. But on, uh, hold your breath, here we go, let's see. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, do you see a kind of title slide on your screen? I yes, hope. we do. Okay, excellent. Now, this is, the, this is what Randolph-Macon College looks like today. It is a massive building. You, 
uh, you, you, as you can see, the building extends uh, you, toward the far horizon uh, beyond the trees. Uh, it's, it's just mammoth. Uh, I, I was there a few years ago, a, a, a very valued colleague in environmental studies named Sarah Soika has taken students there to do uh, sur environmental surveys of the property uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, testing the ground and the, uh, everything geologists and environmental people test to see if, um, if the uh, area around the building uh, yeah, is uh, capable of, of, with, of holding the building into the future. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, to some extent, they've been testing the structure itself. It's not clear whether this building will still be around 10 years from now. So if you want to see it, you need to go out and see it soon. Uh, but there is a local group valiantly trying to save the site, clear the land, and put up signage uh, more properly interpreting it. But this is where your college or your college's ancestor began. Uh, it was chartered in 1830. Uh, it opened for business uh, with students in, uh, in um, 1832. Uh, and it, uh, it was named for uh, two very prominent Democratic Party politicians who had served together in the House of Representatives and again briefly served together in the U.S. Senate, Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina uh, and John Randolph of Virginia, who by the time he was in his 30s started calling himself John Randolph of Roanoke, obviously not the Roanoke the city that we know that didn't exist in his lifetime, but um, a Roanoke plantation where he uh, lived when he wasn't in Washington in the middle of nowhere in Charlotte County on um, overlooking the Roanoke River and that stretch I'm told by people in Charlotte County, just to confuse us is called the Stanton River. So John Ro uh, Randolph of Roanoke plantation. I, the, I, these two men, oh, and then eventually of course, uh, William Waugh Smith, who was the president of Randolph-Macon College, uh, was looking for a location to start a coordinate woman's college. Uh, he, he didn't want to establish it uh, anywhere near Randolph-Macon College, which after the Civil War had moved to Ashland, uh, north of Richmond. Uh, he didn't want to put it near the men's college because that would be uh, distracting to the men and to the women, uh, some people said. So he was looking around for a place that was near, but not too near. Uh, and he was lobbied by real estate interests in Lynchburg uh, after the opening up of the Rivermont area, after the building of the big bridge from downtown, they wanted a prestigious place to anchor the new neighborhood. Uh, and what could be better than a woman's college, a place of legitimacy, uh, a place of prestige, uh, but a place where the, uh, the uh, clientele would not be raucous, uh, would be well behaved, uh, a perfect place to drive up the real estate values. Uh, and so uh, William Waugh Smith became president of both colleges simultaneously uh, and uh, they got their charter in 1891 and as you know opened the doors to uh, students in 1893. Now Nathaniel Macon uh, was from Warren County, North Carolina, which uh, is on, in uh, north central North Carolina on the Virginia line, uh, not far from Boydton, Virginia. Uh, he, he was for a long time in the House of Representatives uh, and then in the Senate. When he was in the House, he was Speaker uh, during the most of the Jefferson administration. Uh, so uh, he was Speaker of the House and in the same party as the President, very powerful person. Uh, he, he was, uh, like Randolph, an old line Republican, meaning a Democratic Republican, the ancestors of the modern Democrats. Uh, he, he was somebody who believed strongly in states' rights, uh, believed in uh, diminishing uh, national power, uh, believed in not spending much money, uh, believed strongly in slavery, uh, believed in property rights. Uh, he, the, uh, he and John Randolph, of Virginia, who was from Southside, Virginia, uh, so uh, not far from the North Carolina line. He and Macon were not only soulmates politically, but they were not far apart from each other geographically. And they were the biggest names known uh, in Mecklenburg County, where Boydton is, when the college was started. Now, the college was started, as you know, by Methodists, 
Uh, yeah, and neither Randolph nor Macon was a Methodist, uh, yeah, but their political orthodoxy was such uh, yeah, that they appealed greatly to the power structure of Southern Virginia and Northern North Carolina. Uh, yeah, their politics were all correct. And they were both um, reasonably religious men, uh, yeah, more conventionally low church religious, Episcopalian, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, certainly they were nothing that the Methodists, um, uh, Methodists had trouble with uh, religiously. And so they were the natural picks to name the college after to attract um, conservative, um, uh, uh, pro-slavery, um, uh, uh, religious, though not necessarily Methodist, um, uh, fathers and mothers to send their sons to this new college. I, and unlike UVA, which had opened its doors to students in 1825, uh, UVA was secular, didn't even have a chapel until after the Civil War. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wanted it that way. Uh, so these devout Methodists uh, wanted a school which had a chapel and a chaplain and taught uh, pro true Protestant religion to the boys. Uh, so hence, um, Randolph-Macon College uh, was born. But today, I'm not going to give you a talk on the history of the college. That's uh, all the history of the college I'm going to give you. And forgive me if you knew it all uh, to begin with. But I wanted to make clear that uh, John Randolph is not the person that your college was named for. Your college was not named for any person. Nathaniel Macon, John Randolph, neither of them. But uh, it is descended from a college and became a partner of a college that was named for them. So how do you answer the question, who was your college named for? You're on your own. <laughs> you know, I just say it's complicated and take it from there. And I want to talk to you today uh, about a particular appointment that John Randolph had uh, in 1826, on April 8th at 4.30 p.m. on 1826. Uh, on the Virginia shore of the Potomac River, just on the Virginia end of the chain bridge, uh, which was the only bridge connecting Washington DC with Virginia at that time. It was an odd place for an appointment. Um, it was outdoors. Uh, it was a well-trod place. You could tell that people had been there before. The land had been uh, cleared for the activity that went on there. Uh, but it was a very exalted person that he was going to be meeting. He was going to be meeting that day on April 8th, 1826, the Secretary of State, Henry Clay of Kentucky, one of the most famous people in the United States, uh, a person who had had a long distinguished career already uh, in the House of Representatives, mainly partly in the House, partly in the Senate. And he would go on to add to the distinction uh, in the House and the Senate later on uh, becoming known as the Great Compromiser, the person who fashioned the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and then the Compromise of 1850, a person who came uh, within a hair of winning the presidency in 1844, uh, a man who was admired by Abraham Lincoln and many, many other people. Uh, so what were they going to talk about? They weren't going to talk about anything, actually, because they weren't allowed to talk to each other by the rules of what they were going to do. And yet they weren't going to talk foreign policy. They weren't going to talk politics. And yet they were coming and yet to aim pistols at each other. And uh, Henry Clay, at least, fully intended to kill John Randolph. And yet these two men despised each other. They were on opposite ends uh, politically. Uh, yeah, and I'll get into that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, they uh, despised each other personally. Uh, yeah, they were polar opposites in so many ways and almost every way you can think of, except they both had uh, yeah, dueling already under their belt and they both bristled at insults. John Randolph had said the night before to his colleague in the Senate, Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, he had told Benton, that he would not try to uh, hit uh, Henry Clay, that he would purposely miss, uh, although Benton wasn't sure whether when push came to shove, Randolph would keep that intention. Now, these two guys were more than the usual duelists in terms of their high position in government and in terms of their fame, uh, but dueling was not unusual in the 1820s. 
it hadn't been unusual for many, many generations. Uh, and it certainly was not unusual in Virginia. Dueling, formal dueling with formal challenges and a prearranged date and uh, seconds and a choice of weapons by the person challenged. Uh, formal dueling was uh, a go-to method for gentlemen or supposed gentlemen to solve the issues between them. Uh, and uh, what it was, was a, a method of rest restoring a balance that had been messed up by uh, one of the parties. One of the parties had insulted the other on the, uh, in a way that could not be resolved by mere conversation. And the insult had run deep and it had, and it had offended the person's honor it had humiliated the person in some way in front of others. I, and I, so when you dueled with somebody, what you did was I, you, asked, you, you insisted that the other person give you uh, uh, the opportunity to restore your honor, to restore your status in the eyes of others by showing how brave and bold you were under pressure. And if you both were brave and bold under pressure, uh, then you both save face out of the encounter. And if you live through the encounter, you can even shake hands and go on and be friends because the balance has been restored. It's, it's um, from our point of view, certainly from my point of view, it's pretty sick, uh, but uh, that's the way this social class and this time and place looked at it. Uh, and in fact, uh, you, you can see uh, the legacy of it still carried out today. Uh, heck, you didn't have to be a gentleman to do this. It's just that they didn't, um, they didn't call it dueling when people of the working class did it. When Abraham Lincoln uh, broke away from his parents and uh, his, mother, his stepmother and his father and went out on his own to New Salem, Illinois, on, on, uh, when he was a very young man, when he first entered the town, he discovered that this gang of young men kind of ran things and you couldn't get anywhere in the town unless you either became one of them or somehow did something to show the gang that you were not to be messed with. And so Lincoln challenged the head of the gang to a wrestling match. Uh, and so they wrestled, they took off their shirts and they wrestled with a big crowd around them. Uh, yet nobody really knows who won, if, if either party won, but they fought each other man to man. Uh, and it was the fight where neither one gave in. They either, uh, one either decisively beat the other and the other admitted it, uh, or, or uh, yet they fought to a tie, which is probably what they did. And Lincoln gained face immediately. I, and I became one of the guys in New Salem. Uh, bad movies, you've seen plenty of bad movies, bad male bonding movies where guys pummel each other and then uh, that they become friends. That's kind of the idea be, be, uh, behind many of these duels. The, the, the trick was though that you had to live through the duel to get to that stage. Uh, well, uh, in, uh, and in fact, it wasn't just an American thing, uh, not too many years before, uh, yeah, this happened. There was a memorable duel in France between two guys uh, who fought from hot air balloons in the air. The guy who was challenged had the right to choose the place and the weapons, and so he chose rifles in the air from hot air balloons. Uh, yeah, uh, you can imagine this drew a mammoth crowd, and the duel ended when one of the balloons was shot out of the sky. Uh, yeah, there was another duel in 1843 between two Frenchmen uh, the guy challenged chose billiard balls. They threw billiard balls at each other uh, until one killed the other with a well-aimed red ball to the, to the head. Uh, I've often felt that if somebody ever challenged me to a duel and I got to choose the weapons, I would choose historical trivia uh, because nobody gets hurt and I would be sure to, to uh, win, I think. Well, in any case, in Virginia, uh, as, uh, as elsewhere, uh, this was the way you settled disputes that could not be settled merely by more talking. Uh, and uh, on this day, uh, Henry Clay uh, meant business. He fully intended 
uh, to uh, dispatch uh, his opponent. Just as six years earlier, uh, two naval officers had fought, including the world famous uh, Commodore Stephen Decatur, uh, who fought with a, uh, another uh, naval officer named James Barron, uh, not far from where Clay and, uh, and uh, Randolph fought, just on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Uh, Decatur had served on a, uh, a tribunal that had court-martialed James Barron a few years before. And the result was that Barron was demoted. This created a lot of bad blood between them. One thing led to another, and they met on the dueling ground in 1820, James Barron killing uh, uh, Commodore Decatur, one of the most high profile people, Americans at least, to be killed in a duel. This duel uh, actually was one trigger event that made John Randolph go a little bit insane for a while. Uh, as we'll get to, John Randolph had many physical and emotional problems. I, and I had to take time out from his regular life and his job I, to be a bit bonkers, I, to be uh, uh, unhinged. Uh, and he would have to retire to Roanoke where he would be cared for by his enslaved men and women until he was ready to go back into the public arena. This uh, was one of the events that set him off. Uh, a little bit uh, after the duel between Clay and Randolph in 1838, uh, there was a fatal duel between two members of Congress. When a Kentucky congressman, uh, William Graves, uh, a Whig, a follower of Henry Clay, killed a Democratic congressman from Maine. Uh, the, uh, the Maine a Democrat was not a very good shot with pistols, so he chose rifles, and they blasted away at each other for three rounds on, until uh, Silly was shot in the leg and bled out in two or three minutes. I, uh, dueling was, uh, was uh, common enough that many gentlemen had dueling pistols. It was almost part of their wardrobe. I, and these are John Randolph's dueling pistols. They're on display at the Virginia Historical Society, now the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in, uh, in Richmond. We can't be absolutely sure that these were the dueling pistols that he used that day. Uh, against Henry Clay, although they probably were, but it says something about Randolph uh, to know that he had several pairs of dueling pistols uh, because not only did he have the pair that he bought and that he favored, but people would send him dueling pistols as presents. It was their honor for uh, him to, uh, to have them. Now, uh, Henry Clay, uh, was, the, uh, uh, was the second person to arrive at the dueling ground. John Randolph liked to be early uh, and he was waiting for him. The seconds conferred on the rules. Uh, they marked off the paces. We're not sure if they stood back to back and marched or if they simply took their, their marks that the seconds made in the dirt. Uh, the count was spoken, one, two, three. Uh, each fired. Clay hit a boulder behind Randolph. Randolph's shot kicked up dirt behind Clay. Both seemed to be actually trying to hit the other. They didn't miss by all that much, but each stood their ground firmly, showed manliness, and that should have been enough. That often was enough in duels. As long as you showed that you were no coward, that you had honor, the duel could end honorably after one exchange of fire. The, one of the seconds asked, has honor been satisfied? And uh, Randolph um, hesitated, didn't know, apparently know what to say at first. And Clay uh, said, no, honor has not been satisfied. So he insisted on a second round. And so the seconds reloaded the dueling pistols uh, they had the, uh, the participants get back on their marks. Uh, they, uh, the second counted off the, the numbers one, two, three, and they fired again. And this time Henry Clay's bullet uh, went hurtling through uh, the air right toward the center of John Randolph's body. Now, um, who was this guy uh, standing um, a, a few feet from that oncoming bullet? What I can do as a historian is I can, uh, I can play with time 
the way you and I, alas, cannot do with our own time uh, allotted to us. But I can suspend the bullet in midair I, and um, tell you something about John Randolph. I, uh, you'll have to go elsewhere to learn more about Henry Clay. We only have so much more time. But uh, let me tell you about John Randolph. I, his mother was Frances Bland, um, who uh, was from a, uh, an FFV family, the first families of Virginia. She uh, grew up in a wealthy uh, Tidewater family. I, and I, she brought to her marriage to a Randolph, the, uh, uh, John Randolph's father, John Randolph Sr., of the kind of fortune that an already wealthy young man wanted in a wife. So they became even more wealthy when Frances Bland uh, married John Randolph Sr. I, she had on, uh, uh, three children in, in rapid succession, uh, but uh, after the last of her children by John Randolph, John Randolph Jr., in effect, uh, she, uh, uh, her husband died. Uh, John Randolph Sr. died when our John Randolph was a toddler. And so shortly after that, some months after that, uh, she started being courted. She's a very eligible widow, started being courted uh, by this newly arrived immigrant from Bermuda, St. George Tucker. There's a town in Bermuda, the, the second largest town in Bermuda is called St. George after his family, uh, one of the wealthiest families in Bermuda. So St. George, uh, um, St. George Tucker arrives in Virginia shortly before the outbreak of the uh, American Revolution. And he uses his Bermuda ties uh, to become a blockade runner. He runs supplies through the British blockade during the Revolutionary War. He has relatives and friends in Bermuda uh, who are merchants and who siphon away a portion of a cargo uh, that they receive from Europe and save it uh, for the blockade runners coming from Virginia uh, that will run the British blockade and come into Hampton Roads and unload supplies for the revolutionaries. St. George Tucker also joined the military off and on uh, during the Revolutionary War. He was wounded at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina, and he witnessed the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. So St. George Tucker's patriotic credentials are impeccable. His wealth is significant. Uh, he's a, a young, vigorous man. He's uh, everything uh, a rich widow might be looking for. So uh, they marry, and St. George Tucker becomes one of the most important people in young John Randolph's life. Randolph idolizes St. George Tucker, at least when he's young. They had a falling out later over money when Randolph was an adult. Uh, but uh, Randolph imbibed a lot of the principles and values of St. George Tucker. Uh, uh, Tucker also ended up leaving to, uh, to his uh, stepson, three important plantations uh, in Virginia. One was, was Metoax, uh, which is near the confluence of the Appomattox and James Rivers. There's nothing there uh, anymore. Uh, it burned down, it's gone. And in fact, John Randolph sold it um, when he was a young man. Uh, but Metoax was where John Randolph spent on uh, several of his earliest years. Um, then there was Bazaar, which had been named for reasons that we're not sure about uh, by John Randolph's grandfather. I mean, this came into Tucker's um, possession through Francis Bland. Uh, Bazaar was a, a place where John Randolph lived as a young man, uh, lived with his uh, widowed sister-in-law, Judith, uh, Judith Randolph, uh, and Bazaar burned down uh, when Randolph was still a fairly young man. And at that point, I, he, uh, his, uh, his um, sister-in-law had died uh, by this point, and he moved for the rest of his life to Roanoke Plantation. You can see a picture of what Roanoke Plantation looked like. It wasn't much. It wasn't, didn't have the big house I, that we're used to seeing in all these er early Virginia plantation, plantations. Um, Randolph never wanted a big house. He never married. Uh, he had no children. Uh, he was a loner anyway, in very many ways. Uh, and uh, he was content to live there with his very many enslaved men, women, and children, uh, and read books 
Uh, the the um, houses, the little houses there were stuffed with books uh, when they weren't out buildings serving a purpose or slave quarters. Uh, and uh, people were shocked actually when they visited Roanoke to find out just how simply uh, John Randolph lived. That's partly why Randolph, there are many reasons, but partly why Randolph is not so much known anymore, even though he was a major figure in his lifetime, because there's no place to visit. Uh, we have Montpelier for Madison and Monticello for Jefferson and Highland for Monroe and Mount Vernon for Washington. There's no place to go visit for John Randolph. Uh, his, uh, his houses are all gone now, uh, and there was never much to Roanoke to begin with. But there was uh, a lot to his horse, Roanoke. Uh, John Randolph loved horses. He was actually friendlier with horses than with people. And I don't mean that as a joke, it's really true. Uh, his greatest friends were horses and dogs. He loved hound dogs and he loved horses, many of whom he raced. Uh, he, uh, if he had, um, if he had um, a, a, a non-alcoholic and not drug uh, on drug uh, vice, it was horse racing. And he, he, um, he gambled a bit, but not as much as some. This was his prize horse, his prize racehorse, Roanoke. And this is an ad from later in his life when he's putting Roanoke out to stud. Uh, yeah, and uh, he says in the ad that uh, he will not uh, pair Roanoke with any more than 45 other mares uh, than the mares that he himself has. So if, if you want to be one of the 45, you got to get in line. And then it is this exhaustive pedigree uh, in the ad for Roanoke. Uh, and here we see a drawing of John Randolph uh, when he was uh, in older middle age. He died just a week before he turned 60, uh, riding along on his horse, one of his many horses with his dogs uh, following along. I, I, the, the kind of uh, way that John Randolph would want to have been remembered. Uh, but uh, beyond this, uh, why is he a, a, a noted public figure? Uh, well, uh, he, um, he was elected to Congress when he was 25 years old, which is the minimum uh, age you can be to be elected to the House uh, under the Constitution. Uh, he uh, got this job uh, because he was a Randolph, uh, because he had enormous wealth, he had enormous connections, uh, and he was a brilliant orator. Uh, and that counted for something in a face-to-face -face society, uh, a society where uh, people interacted with each other face-to-face -face and one kind of physicality or another mattered. John Randolph uh, was uh, a, a strange looking fellow. Uh, he, he had tall, spindly legs, very, very skinny legs that were too tall for his body. He had a fairly short uh, torso. He didn't have much of a neck. Uh, he had uh, a hairless body and face. Uh, he had um, delicate features, which looked stranger and stranger as he got old uh, or older. He had a very high voice. And uh, so he was no George Washington in, uh, in appearance. You would think that that would disqualify him uh, for high office, uh, except that it was, it was um, canceled out partly by his wealth and status and family ties. But it was also uh, canceled out by his mesmerizing oratory. Now, like Patrick Henry, um, who was perhaps the greatest orator in American history, um, he never wrote out a speech. Very frustrating to historians, neither Henry nor Randolph ever wrote a speech. Uh, so we don't have any texts. All we have are reminiscences of people waxing uh, rhapsodically uh, about just how hypnotized they were by listening to these men speak. Uh, so um, Randolph gets elected at age 25. And you can see he looks younger than that. He's painted when he gets elected by none other than Gilbert Stuart. That in itself indicates the kind of connections this uh, man had. Uh, so he's elected. Uh, he, he serves in the last year of the John Adams administration. He's very much on the outs with Adams and the Federalists. But then Jefferson gets elected in 1800 and inaugurated in 1801. The Democratic Republicans take over the Congress. And John Randolph, uh, at the age of 27, 
becomes chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, the most powerful committee in the House of Representatives, because every bill has to go through the Ways and Means Committee. And at that time, on the, on the chair of that committee was really the second most uh, powerful person in the House. Uh, he was in the House leadership second only to the Speaker. Uh, and the Speaker was Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina. Uh, so John Randolph at the age of 27 is most, one of the most powerful people uh, in the United States. And yet he looked like um, a, a student at some college. And uh, when he went out to take the oath of office, uh, the, uh, the clerk of the house uh, asked him uh, if he was old enough to serve. And he asked him only half, half facetiously. And Randolph uh, stood up straight and stuck his chin out and said, ask my constituents. Uh, so Randolph uh, was indicating right at the start that he was nobody to be uh, messed with. Uh, well, uh, he, as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, as the most important person, except for the speaker in the House of Representatives, uh, he was basically the floor leader for uh, President Jefferson in the House. Uh, he carried through, for example, the appropriation to buy the Louisiana Purchase. Even though Randolph was um, had some scruples about that, the Constitution didn't say you could buy new territory, and so Randolph wasn't sure about this. But he was a good soldier on that uh, on that occasion, and saw that Jefferson got his appropriation. But as time went on, Randolph was uh, disillusioned with Jefferson. Jefferson compromised too much. Uh, Jefferson thought the national interest did not always square. Um, with uh, the orthodoxy of an old Republican that believed that any accretion of power to the federal government is bad. Uh, and uh, when Jefferson tried secretly to buy Florida, uh, that's when, uh, that was the last straw. John Randolph broke with Thomas Jefferson, denounced President Jefferson uh, in uh, a uh, powerful speech, people said it was powerful, uh, and uh, as a result, Randolph was stripped of his committee chairmanship uh, because Randolph felt that Jefferson was not Jeffersonian enough. Randolph felt he was standing on principle. And so Randolph was stripped of his power in the House leadership. Now, of course, this could never happen today that somebody, a member of the House of Representatives, member of the leadership, stripped of their leadership position because they stand on principle. Thank God we've gotten beyond that. Well, anyway, but I digress. Uh, now, um, Randolph's Southside constituents didn't mind that he got stripped of his leadership position. They still felt that uh, he was saying the right things and they kept reelecting him, except for one time. They defeated him one time, uh, and that was in 1812, because he opposed the War of 1812. He felt that the war was unnecessary and the war would make the federal government too powerful because wars always make the national government more powerful, patriotism and all of that. So Randolph stood firmly against the war. He voted against the war and uh, his constituents threw him out of office as a result. Uh, he was defeated actually by Thomas Jefferson's um, son-in-law, uh, the, the husband of, uh, uh, of um, Jefferson's younger daughter, Maria. Uh, so, uh, but he's only out for two years. What his constituents do is they spank him for opposing the War of 1812, and then they reelect him on the, uh, after um, uh, Jefferson's son-in-law, Epps, has, has served uh, one two-year term. Uh, so uh, he, was, he was beloved by his constituents, or at least by his voters. And that's important because not many people were allowed to vote, even uh, not, uh, not all that many white men were allowed to vote. It was a uh, property qualification. So it was well-to-do people who were doing the voting. Now, at about that time, uh, uh, somebody uh, described Randolph as, quote, a singular looking man with a young old face and a short small body mounted upon a pair of high crane legs and thighs so that when he stood up, you did not know when he was to end. I, and uh, this silhouette, which was done of him as an older man, 
I mean, it's still the profile, it was pretty much the same profile he had throughout his life. The tall spindly legs, the long coat, he always carried or almost always carried a riding crop with him and he would slap uh, the palm of one hand uh, with the riding crop as he orated uh, in the house or on the hustings. Uh, Randolph would also uh, bring his collar way up uh, over uh, the side of his face, I think to hide the fact that he didn't have much of a neck. Uh, and that was to, uh, because people made fun of him for all sorts of reasons, uh, and that would uh, conceal that. Now, um, Randolph, uh, so Randolph had a kind of girlish look, a girlish voice, a hairless body and face, and, and, uh, and yet he had a swaggering, belligerent appearance. And he, he, um, he was constantly uh, criticizing his opponents in a very personal way, which flirted with uh, the, the, dueling, uh, the, the uh, dueling ground. Uh, and many have speculated, I think quite plausibly, that his belligerence uh, was compensation um, for his uh, feminine appearance, uh, for which people constantly made fun of him. And he had these delicate coloring and soft features. And he, uh, he sounded, one observer said, like, quote, a squeaking, uh, a squeaking boy just before he breaks into manhood, unquote. And he told a nephew in the 1820s that some disease in his early life uh, had stunted him sexually. Uh, he had scarlet fever, he had yellow fever too, though, though neither disease generally has that kind of effect. We don't really know why he, uh, he looked the way he did. An autopsy inevitably was done after he died in 1833, um, which found that uh, his testicles were, quote, mere rudiments, unquote. So he never sexually uh, matured. And, and, and after his return to public life, after he was um, out of it for a while in one of his bouts of what some called madness, uh, when he came back in 1815, he started using opiates on, a, a lot. Uh, and uh, this, uh, some people said this was to compensate not only for his physical afflictions, but for his mental torments. Uh, he once yelled out in Congress when someone yelled a taunt at him from across the chamber. He once yelled out, I am not a wild animal to be exhibited. And yet this was a, a profoundly unhappy man. Um, the, the, the one young woman that he was linked with in any way and that he wanted people to link him with was this girl named Maria Ward, whom he started taking an interest in when she was 13. Uh, he, uh, he was 11 years older, and by his own account, he courted her for two years uh, when uh, they broke up, he said, when she was 15 and he was 26, and yet she lived on a big plantation in Amelia County, and yet she later went on to marry at the age of 22 to a son of former Attorney General Edmund Randolph, so she married a Randolph, but not John Randolph. Um, I don't know whether she saw their relationship in the same way he did. But it's almost as if to say, uh, it's almost as if Randolph needed to have some sort of relationship with a young woman in his resume uh, to indicate that he wasn't the, uh, the uh, freak that some people called him. And, and uh, as he got older, uh, because I think of the combination of his emotional torment and his physical problems. Uh, he he uh, depended more and more on various uh, kinds of uh, opium variously administered. Uh, he he uh, also uh, did mercury, much to the destruction of his health, I think. Uh, calomel was liquid mercury. He uh, engaged in that for some of his physical ailments. But for his emotional pain, uh, as well as his constant diarrhea, laudanum does have a uh, an, an effect on diarrhea, uh, he, that's liquid opium. Uh, he he uh, dosed himself with opium liberally. He was, he was an opium addict uh, and also drank heavily. It's actually kind of amazing that he lived to be almost 60 years old. Uh, well, uh, his, uh, his uh, constituents 
kind of knew about this. Uh, he, he couldn't mask it and he would, uh, he, he would act erratically sometimes in Washington, in plain view, in the halls of Congress. Uh, he once caned another congressman uh, in uh, you know, a, a Capitol building stairway. And he um, uh, uh, physically jumped on people from time to time. Uh, he said wild things. Uh, his enslaved uh, uh, manservants said uh, during one of his bouts at Roanoke that he would go out in the middle of the night, get on a horse, ride, galloping like crazy across the fields, yelling, Macbeth has murdered sleep. Macbeth has murdered sleep. Uh, he uh, suffered from insomnia uh, much of his life. Uh, but at the same time, when he was lucid, which was the majority of the time, um, uh, uh, Randolph was a, uh, a brilliant, well-read, uh, excruciatingly logical defender of old republicanism, um, which means I, the philosophy of the English country party of the 1730s and 1740s, people who distrusted the central government, distrusted the monarchy and the parliament and the courts, I, people who, who uh, distrusted anything but the, uh, the virtuous country farmer. Uh, you found virtue in the countryside uh, with uh, big farmers like him like John Randolph, who were untainted by the vices of the big city, uh, uh, by the vice, and the, the biggest city in Randolph's lifetime was Philadelphia, which had about 20,000 people at the time of the revolution. Uh, the, uh, the country was where virtue was bred and uh, government was intrinsically evil. And the goal, the, the responsibility of country gentlemen was to constantly rein in government, keep it from harming people. He would have loved Ronald Reagan's uh, statement that government cannot solve your problems, government is the problem. Except Ronald Reagan um, spent money and he used government for all sorts of different things. Ronald Reagan would have had a, I mean, uh, John Randolph would have had a falling out with Ronald Reagan about two months into the Reagan administration. Now, of course, uh, slavery is bound up in this. You can't talk about any of these people without talking uh, about slavery. He was an odd mix on this subject. Uh, his revered stepfather, St. George Tucker, had in 1796 written a pamphlet uh, advocating gradual emancipation with colonization of freed people to Africa. Uh, that's about as far as, um, as you could go in Virginia and stay active in Virginia um, uh, with uh, any emancipation dreams. I, uh, John Randolph believed in, uh, in the evil of slavery. He said constantly that slavery, not just the slave trade, but slavery was an intrinsic evil because it took away people's liberty, uh, which was the most sacred thing anyone can have. Um, but at the same time, Randolph um, uh, broke with his stepfather uh, in that he decided that colonization was never going to work, uh, that, uh, that colonization was uh, a pipe dream, uh, that, oh, I seem to have, yeah, there we are, uh, that colonization, first of all, was going to be too expensive. Uh, it was going to be impractical because you couldn't force people to go to Africa. But more than that, Randolph decided after a five-year period when he uh, helped to found the American Colonization Society to free some enslaved people and send them to the new colony of Liberia. Uh, he, uh, from 1816, when he helped found it, to the early 1820s, when he dropped out of the organization, he decided that even, even telling enslaved people that they had a prospect of becoming free and going to Africa, that was dangerous because the notion of potential freedom in the minds of the enslaved made them uh, think about rebellion. And so for the security of white people, Randolph felt that even colonization was not uh, a viable option, that the only way slavery needed to go, and he did need to go, uh, was for it to die out on its own, which meant really uh, when it ceased to be profitable to the slave owners. 
That wasn't going to be for a while. In fact, on the eve of the Civil War, slave property was at an all-time high in valuation. The cotton kingdom of the Southwest was booming, needing new slaves all the time, and Virginia was making money hand over fist, selling enslaved human beings to Mississippi and Arkansas and Texas and Alabama. So when would slavery have died on its own? Probably early to mid 20th century. I had an argument with Annette Gordon-Reed from Harvard when she was down here for a slavery symposium five years ago. It was at lunch with students gathered around. It was really interesting. I was arguing that World War I probably would be when slavery died out on its own because it had ceased to make enough profits. And she said, no, not World War I, World War II. That's when slavery would have died out. In other words, John Randolph was sincere in saying slavery was an evil. He meant it, but he wasn't going to do anything about it in his lifetime. And that is very similar, actually, to Jefferson, although Jefferson at least supported the idea of colonization, and Jefferson at least freed five enslaved people in his lifetime in his will and allowed a few other enslaved people to leave Monticello without pursuing them. Those few people were probably his own children. But Randolph never did that. Randolph never, so far as we know, never freed a single person. And Randolph was one of the biggest slave owners in his lifetime. He never freed a single person. He was one of the biggest slave owners in America. At the end of his life, in his will, and he, this is complicated too, but he freed all of his slaves. He had no direct descendants and he did regard slavery as an evil. So he freed what we think are 383 enslaved people. It's the second or third largest uh, manumission in Virginia history. And 383 people scattered among different land holdings um, is Caribbean level slave holding. It's an incredible number of slaves for a person in North America to have held. One of the biggest slave owners in America who believed slavery was evil but felt that nothing could be done about it because if government moved against it, that was a violation of property rights. And now, um, he, he, made, he made three wills, uh, one of which said the slaves should be sold, and that was the most recent will I, it, it took 12 years of court action to decide which will would apply. And if you want to hear more about that, I'll stay for a few minutes afterward uh, and we can, we can talk uh, further about that. Uh, but one of, the, one of the reasons why Randolph opposed a powerful federal government is that if you let the federal government uh, uh, gather more power on one issue, like um, building uh, uh, interstate canals and railroads um, or, or turnpikes, uh, then where does it stop? If you give the government that power, then the federal government someday is going to try to free your slaves. And he used that, uh, that argument time and again uh, as kind of a, a closer. Uh, you couldn't argue with that if you were a property-owning man uh, who voted in uh, early 19th century Virginia. So it was partly a tactic, but he believed it too. Uh, well, I, 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 as you can imagine, um, he was increasingly out of uh, sympathy with the modern world, because uh, the modern world was not rooted in the English country party of the 1730s. He was increasingly disturbed by, I, by uh, the abolitionist movement, by the efforts by uh, people to enhance the power of the federal government, people who were led by Henry Clay and his Whig party. Uh, he, uh, he, Randolph was in sympathy with his half-brother, Nathaniel Beverly Tucker, St. George Tucker's son by a, a second wife, uh, who was a law professor at William and Mary. Nathaniel Beverly Tucker and John Randolph were two of the earliest secessionists uh, in American history. Randolph said uh, that he felt secession was a, vi a viable option. He said this by 1830 or so, uh, a viable option uh, if the federal government was going to do anything to put 
slavery on the downturn. To protect slavery, I, he would say Virginia might someday have to secede. And this was the view of the leading uh, law professor in Virginia, his half-brother, Nathaniel Beverly Tucker. Uh, so the, uh, the old, uh, older Randolph, and in this painting by Chester Harding, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit um, oh, um, gentle with uh, Randolph's wrinkles, but you can see how he still had a kind of boyish look. But the closer you got, people said, the more you could see his wrinkles, and that's why they described him as an old young man. Uh, he, uh, he uh, in his last years, fought against the increasing democratization of America and Virginia. Uh, his last major political uh, occasion was on the Constitutional Convention of 1829, which met to revise the 1776 state constitution, which had maintained the old colonial rules for voting, qualifications for voting high property qualifications, which generally were 100 acres of uh, unimproved land or 25 acres of improved land, that is farmed land, um, or if you had a house and a lot in town, that in a town that you owned, you could vote. And yet, well, Randolph wanted very much to keep that, those franchise rules. He wanted property owners, significant property owners, to be the only voters because they were the people, he said, who had a stake in society. So a white man uh, who rents or a white man who owns only um, 20 acres of uh, land, improved or unimproved, that's not enough. He doesn't have a, a, enough of a stake uh, to have a right to vote. Uh, this was the main issue at the Constitutional Convention because the Western counties uh, wanted the franchise rules changed. Uh, yet they were upset at the, uh, at the property qualifications. They were also upset the way the districts were created by the planters who ran the legislature. Uh, yet the, dis the way the districts were created uh, favored uh, uh, the, the East, favored the planters. Uh, well, Randolph got up and gave a famous speech in this constitutional convention. This is a, a very primitive uh, painting by George Catlin uh, of the uh, convention. It's really a group portrait. This is former President James Madison, who was almost 80 years old, uh, presenting uh, a document to the chair, former President James Monroe, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall was there, future President John Tyler was there, a lot of notable uh, well-to-do white guys were there. Um, and uh, it was uh, the last meeting of a lot of these people and the first time that a lot of them had been in a room together. Randolph was there. I, I have never been able to pick him out. Catlin was just learning how to paint really. I, a lot of these guys look alike, but he's there. And he listened through most of the convention without saying a word. They met in the old House of Delegates chamber in the, in the Capitol building. Uh, but at the very end, when they were ready to tie things up and vote on the Constitution, uh, he rose to speak from the, the corner of the room. Uh, he, uh, in his high voice, he yelled out, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, when he did, a uh, word spread outside the chamber that Randolph was about to speak. And uh, people from outside crowded into the chamber so that there was barely a speck of floor space that you could see. I, and I, in that speech, I, he talked about uh, the tyranny of numbers. He talked about king numbers. He said that we had thrown off a monarchy in the revolution, but we still wanted a king apparently. And this king was not named George. This king was named Numbers. King numbers. If you have more people, you have more power. That was the new idea. That's the democratic, with a small d, the democratic idea. And he said that was going to be the end of everything. Because once you succumb to king numbers, then the vulgar will take over. The uneducated will take over. The people who don't know what they're doing, who have no honor, who have no real stake in society, have no respect for tradition. King numbers. 
might be the most famous speech he ever gave in part because there was a secretary there who tried to write down every word everybody said. And so it's the closest thing we have to a text of uh, any of John Randolph's uh, speeches. Uh, so uh, that was his last big moment in the sun. After that, very shortly after that, a newly inaugurated President Andrew Jackson uh, appoints him ambassador to Russia, of all things, even though he's in terrible shape, the, the worst possible place. And one, one can only assume, and I think it's true, that Jackson just wanted to get rid of him because Jackson knew, even though they were theoretically on the same page on many issues, though not on enfranchising the common man, uh, uh, he knew that Randolph would start denouncing him pretty soon. And so Randolph wanted, I mean, uh, Jackson wanted him out of the country uh, as far away as possible. Uh, in this constitutional convention, uh, they made a few tweaks to uh, getting a little bit more democratic in Virginia, but not much, not much change. The West was still shafted for another generation. The East still dominated all out of proportion to its numbers. Uh, it was only in 1850 uh, when another constitution was written that for the first time in Virginia history, there was relatively fair, a lot fairer um, uh, apportionment and uh, the vote was given to all white men 21 years or over. Also, it was the first time in 1850 that the voters could vote for the governor as opposed to the legislature electing the governor. Randolph, though, by then uh, was in his grave, which brings us back, if you can remember it, brings us back uh, to uh, this duel with uh, the bullet hurtling toward on uh, John Randolph. Now, Henry Clay, who fired the gun that shot out the bullet, he had a problem, which he may not have fully grasped until the bullet struck Randolph. Uh, the problem was that Randolph was emaciated. Uh, a, uh, a person uh, who worked closely with Randolph in the Senate said that he looked like a skeleton in, uh, at this time. And Randolph, even when he wasn't that emaciated, uh, always uh, was easily cold. And so he would wear a, a lot of coats on almost all weathers, uh, often a, a few coats, one over the other. And he would ostentatiously take off a couple of coats and lie them on the floor, on the floor of the house. Uh, and his hound dogs would come and go to sleep on them while he orated. Uh, so he was wearing uh, several coats at this duel and standing sideways to cut down on the angle. So Henry Clay, wanting to, to kill him, uh, had a hard time figuring out where Randolph was in all these coats. Uh, and so the bullet struck, but it went through a coat. It did not hit uh, Randolph's body. Uh, and uh, at, at, at that point, uh, uh, honor was fulfilled. Um, Randolph uh, had, a, had a shot because Clay had fired first I, and uh, to complete the uh, fulfillment of honor, the restoration of balance, John Randolph raised his pistol and fired in the air. I, now, uh, I'm, I'm often asked uh, by uh, people, um, what would John Randolph think of the college today? And for that matter, think of America today. And uh, historians don't like that kind of question because you bring back anybody from the past. Uh, well, you know, if, if, if I lived in the 19th century, I wouldn't be me. Um, I would be bounded by a certain set of cultural values. Uh, but if we could kidnap Randolph just the way he was, say on April 8th, 1826, and put him in a time machine and bring him back to now and give him a gold key guide tour of the college and tell him about the college today. Um, it's, it's easy to imagine that he would be absolutely appalled. There would so, be so many things that would uh, disgust and appall him. Um, he, he opposed public female assertiveness of almost any kind. Uh, he never really championed serious equal female education. Uh, he, the, he regarded racial equality 
as uh, an abomination and uh, absolutely unthinkable. Uh, and so the college's celebration of ethnic diversity and alternate lifestyles, God help us, that would have perplexed him, just really perplexed him and then horrified him. And as for American culture in general, if he had a hard time with Henry Clay, <laughs> what would he have done with Vice President Kamala Harris? Uh, or for that matter, Joe Biden's whole cabinet. Uh, and, and yet it's too easy to dismiss him. Uh, it's very easy to dismiss him as a crank. Uh, uh, Henry Adams, the historian in the 1880s, the uh, great grandson of John Adams, Henry Adams wrote a history of the Jefferson and Madison administrations and he called Randolph a lunatic monkey and said that Randolph was the only historical figure that he had ever written about whom he detested. Now, of course, he was an Adams and Randolph had made fun of his great great grandfather and his grandfather, but um, uh, still that was the opinion of many and it still is the opinion of, of some and certainly Randolph was strange. I, and I, I don't just mean his political views, which were commonplace at the time, but he was personally strange, which was why I think he never really made it back into leadership. He was unreliable. He had enormous problems, which would, if, if he weren't so belligerent, would cry out for great sympathy, actually. I, he never really faced the logic of his views on the evils of slavery and his determination to keep the evil no matter what. I, but I, still, we ought to take him seriously. I, I, yeah, he had all these problems, but I, he, I, think about a guy who, who felt that tradition was important, um, who felt that the undue influence of commerce and money was a bad thing, um, who be bewailed the decline of standards, the vulgarization of life, both private life and public life by our politicians, a, a, a guy who, uh, who reviled uh, corruption and cheating. Um, you know, those things, while we have different standards of what honor is, uh, and we disagree with most of his particular political positions, sometimes fiercely disagree. But if you've ever, ever despised a demagogic politician, uh, if you've ever uh, been dismayed by ignorant voters, uh, if you've ever lamented the triumph of business values or uh, bemoaned the reluctance to call something dreadful uh, because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, if you don't like the blurring of the line between uh, literature and pulp uh, or uh, art and schlock, um, if, if, in short, if you don't like some of the, tr uh, the trends in modern, a modern capitalistic democracy, then you've got the basis for some kind of interesting conversation with John Randolph. Um, I, I say that, uh, that you have the basis for a conversation with him. That is, um, if he would deign to have a conversation with you. Well, I look forward to your questions and I thank you very much. That was wonderful, John. Oh gosh. Um, yes. Thank you very, very much. And I, I know I've kept you late, so I'm sorry. Well, well it was wonderful. Um, those who need to leave, we certainly understand. Um, and if you can stay with a question, uh, John is willing to stay for a while. Um, so do any immediately, you can either write it in the chat or raise your hand. Cheryl, hi. Hi. I want you to know that I was uh, very curious about this talk because I'm a native Virginian and I was born in John Randolph Hospital in Hopewell, Virginia. Uh -huh. So I had always been curious. So I really appreciate your inclusiveness and his foibles <laughs> and um, just the interest that you brought to his story. So thank you very much. 
Well, thank you. So Hopewell is at the confluence of the Appomattox and, and the James, James River, and on, that's why it's, that hospital was named for John Randolph, since Matoix was near there. Um, and so was the other, the, the place where he was born, but didn't really live. Well, thanks. Very is much. that, do you know if that hospital is still there? Is it still named for him? I would think it would be. There's not much that changes in Virginia. <laughs> and um, I'm very proud of that, by the way, but I do believe it is still there. John, I have an alum who wants to know, did John Randolph have any association with Macon, which would be meaningful for our former name as RMWC? Oh, well, uh, they, they were not personally close, but um, especially in the first term of the Jefferson administration, they were the, the number one and number two people in the leadership in the House. And uh, yeah, so they, they had to work closely together and so they were, they were strong political allies uh, and they, they uh, worked again together in the, in the very brief time, the two years that Randolph was in the Senate in the mid 1820s, Macon uh, near the end of his life was in the Senate from North Carolina. So they, they worked together again. Um, Randolph was only in the Senate for two years because he was, he was selected by the legislature to finish the term of James Barber who John Quincy Adams had made Secretary of War. I, and after the duel with Henry Clay, um, the, the duel was embarrassing to some members of Congress, some members of the Senate. Uh, and also Randolph had been increasingly erratic in his uh, speeches and people in the galleries had laughed at him. Uh, and that was a source of some embarrassment. And so after the duel, um, the Virginia legislature um, uh, decided that they would not uh, reelect him after the two years were up. And so they selected John Tyler um, over him to be the Senator um, at the start of a new term. But anyway, Macon and, Macon and Randolph were not personally close, though they got along on, they, they broke with each other on, on certain questions on Macon with somebody who, who stayed in power longer. He, he, he had more, um, more status as a, uh, a deal maker than Randolph did. James Monroe said Randolph was uh, a, a, a brilliant man at tearing things down, but lacks the talents of the builder. Uh, he couldn't build anything, but he was great at destroying things, at criticizing things. Macon was more uh, conciliatory than Randolph was. But to my knowledge, Randolph never laid into Macon, never, never taunted Macon or made fun of him or called him a name the way he did with many people whom he broke with. Uh, I, I should say too that on slavery, Randolph always believed that slavery was an evil. The, the saying was it's a necessary evil. Um, Macon believed that early on, but Macon after about 1820 1820, 1823 or so, I uh, started believing that um, that uh, slavery was a positive good, and, um, and uh, Randolph never did. Was there another question, Kit? There you go. So I'm in California, and here, anybody that's been affiliated with slavery is having their name taken off of schools and statues torn down in that. Um, is Randolph College at some point going to be faced with having to change its name? Do you think? Well, uh, that's a question for the trustees and the, um, and the, the students and the alumni. And uh, when, when the co-ed decision came down and the, uh, the school was, was about to go co-ed, there was a committee of the trustees uh, to figure out what the new name would be because it, um, it, the name obviously had to change and there was already a Randolph-Macon College and there was already a Macon College. I, and there, there was some discussion as I understand it, I wasn't in these discussions of course, but uh, I was told by trustees that there was discussion of whether uh, the name should be changed altogether. 
um, I was asked by the chair of that committee who has since passed away, um, whether I was asked about John Randolph and asked to tell them something about John Randolph. So I did, I told them much of what I've told you. Um, I, uh, and I, I won't name names, it's not my place to do so, but I was told that certain trustees felt the name should be changed and others, the majority did not, feeling that, um, that some link to the past was essential um, uh, in part um, just so people would, would have an easier time knowing exactly what this place was and what its history was and it was connected to the old place. And also uh, it, was, it was felt that, that it might be insulting to the alumni to drop the name altogether. But that's more for you to, to tell me than for me to tell you. Um, uh, as far as removing everybody connected with slavery, well, of course, we can't do that uh, because um, we'd have to rename the Washington Monument and, uh, and so many other things. Uh, the, uh, to me, the standard is what did people do it with the totality of their lives? And um, uh, certainly George Washington, who indeed was a slave owner, uh, but who, who actually uh, freed all of his slaves in his, in his will and not only that, but, uh, uh, but on, wrote in a private letter that if there were a civil war over slavery, that he would have to, quote, be of the Northern. Washington, after all, personified the American Revolution. He led the Continental Army. Uh, yeah, yeah, he presided over the Constitutional Convention. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, 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 would, I would keep Washington's name on things. I would keep Jefferson's name on things. The Declaration of Independence goes a long way with me. The values and principles of the Declaration go a long way with me. I know Jefferson's had a hard time lately, sometimes deservedly so, but um, we, we need to, uh, to measure the entire person. Uh, John Randolph is a tough one. No, frankly, he's a tough one because uh, he, was, uh, he, he was increasingly outspoken uh, about uh, the the horrors of the abolitionist movement and the, the rights of private property, uh, including human property. Uh, he was very strongly in favor of the expansion of slavery. He voted against the Missouri Compromise, which had been fashioned by Henry Clay, um, because any concession to, um, to um, free territory in the West uh, was um, a, a danger sign to John Randolph. So Randolph's defense of slavery politically was 100%. His denunciation of slavery as a, a kind of abstract thing uh, was sincere, but it didn't get manifested in any, any action other than his private manumission of his slaves. And even that was clouded because Randolph had made a, a will in 1819 which provided for the, uh, the manumission of all of his slaves on his death. Uh, in 1821, he made another will, which said that uh, stuff should be sold to provide money to send them to Ohio, or to send them out of Virginia uh, to some place, turned out to be Ohio, um, where they would be settled and the money should be used to provide them with land. Uh, but then in 1832, a year before he died, he made another will uh, when he said that they should all be sold uh, and the money distributed to his nephews and a niece. Uh, and um, it, it, as you can imagine, all those wills were preserved and some people immediately argued that the last will was made when he was insane and, and uh, so the people deserved to be free. Uh, but I, the, the, the nephews and niece argued that no, the slaves are ours because uh, that's the most recent will. And it took 12, almost 13 years in the courts, went up to the US Supreme Court uh, to figure out um, what should be done. And in the meantime, all the almost 400 people were rented to others waiting to, for, their, uh, for what should happen. I, and finally, uh, the courts ruled that uh, he, he was insane when he made the third will, though that is subject to debate. I, and the people should be free. 
uh, I assume there were probably more than 400 when uh, he died because there are only 383 left on um, 12, almost 13 years later. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm laterally, lateraling the ball to you, the alumni, to, um, to talk about it among yourselves if, if need be. Uh, but I, I do not, as a, as a professor, even a re retiring professor, especially a retiring professor, I don't think it's my call. Um, does that help answer your question just a little bit? No, it's um, here, it's been taken to an extreme. I mean, they're trying to walk, wipe off George Washington's name, certainly Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it is really outrageous, <laughs> but since the, the ball seems to be rolling across the United States, I just wondered if Randolph College would eventually be a yeah, I, I don't think there's any imminent imminent um, possibility of that, although I can't say what will happen in the future. Abe Lincoln's safe. Um, some people who didn't know what they were doing toppled a statue of him, I think, in Portland about a year ago, Portland, Oregon. I think Washington is pretty safe, too. Uh, I, the, the, of course, the central battleground about name changing and eliminating of statues is, has been involving the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I am in, in sympathy with um, removing those statues for the most part or re restricting them to cemeteries and museums and battlefields. I think they belong there. But in the public square, uh, I've, I've, I've studied this very exhaustively and taught, uh, taught it constantly for years. I mean, when those statues were erected, they were part of the the lost cause tradition when Confederate veterans were in undisputed power throughout the Southern states uh, and putting up statues to Confederate heroes was one way of um, cementing the orthodoxy that white supremacy is the way it should be. That, that, that is just the historical reality. I, I think the sources are overwhelming on that. I, and a, a statue in a public square literally and figuratively in the public square is an expression of what we honor, uh, of what we celebrate, of what we respect. And while um, I, I uh, understand the respect for the bravery of any soldiery in any war, um, that's not why most of these statues were erected. I, and so I, I, I don't want to blow them up but I want to move them to a more appropriate place for, for generations of people who no longer celebrate the Confederacy. Nancy, I see you have a question. Yes, hi. I would like to know what happened. Did he go to Russia? Oh, yes, yes, he did go to Russia. I, and he presented his credentials to Tsar Nicholas I and Tsarina, I think her name was Alexandra. I, and I, he, he seemed to have a good time for about a month. He, he met with his counterpart, uh, the foreign minister, on uh, a proposed trade agreement. And then uh, after he was there for about a month, he got sick, got quite ill, and um, he had to leave. And he asked permission from President Jackson to spend most of uh, a year in London on the way back. He'd been to London twice before and he liked it. so. Jackson permitted him to be in London for almost a year on the, on the federal payroll, which is interesting in light of his um, denunciation of wasteful federal spending. Uh, but the idea was maybe he would regain his health and go back to St. Petersburg. But of course he didn't. And uh, he, he returned in eight, the end of 1830 uh, to the United States. And he got elected to the house again. Uh, uh, briefly. So yeah, I spent a month in Russia. Other questions? This has just been great. Gosh, and I appreciate your time, John. Oh, Jane. Hi, Jane. Hi. Good to um, see you. So good to see you too. Um, so as a, as a public historian and preservationist and historian, um, I feel like the question always in grad school is why does this matter? And so I guess outside of the college, college's realm, um, what do you think this important, what do you think John Randolph's importance is to 
either Virginia history or nationally. I know we kind of touched on some of that with kind of broader themes, but um, mm -hmm. how, like, how did you, aside, I'm sure the college obviously had a, um, a hand in it, not the college itself, but being at the college, how, what made you want to study him, I guess? Long-winded question. <laughs> Well, not as long-winded as my answers are, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of you, uh, Janie. Janie Campbell from Fredericksburg is um, a rising star in, in public history in South Carolina and Colum Columbia, South oh, Carolina. Oh, stop. That's not we're true. All, we're all very proud of her, truly. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm writing a, a, a vast, endless history of Virginia from the dinosaurs to the present. There have been a few other histories of Virginia in recent times, but um, this is designed to be really a history of America using Virginia as a vehicle, as a, a laboratory through which the main themes in American history are discussed. And um, you, can't, you can't discuss Virginia history without discussing John Randolph. He was the, for all his idiosyncrasies, um, and, and, and all the ways he was colorful, uh, his um, political consistency um, as a, an absolutely uncompromising example of so-called old Republicanism with a capital O and a capital R is fascinating and important because it, it shows us, I think, what being uncompromising means I, and I, it, it, in, to my way of thinking, it shows us that being uncompromising is not necessarily a virtue, that, I, that in order to, I, to accomplish things, uh, positive things for, uh, for one's own immediate circle, one's family, one's self, one's country, one's world, one has to participate with other people. We participate with one another in this world and that means not insisting on your own way all the time and insisting that people who don't agree with you uh, are somehow corrupt or benighted. Uh, he, he is an example of the extremism of purity. Um, that's my take on him. There are other ways to look at John Randolph. And to some, uh, he is a hero. He's a hero of those who defend personal liberty. Um, the, the last major biography of him was by um, a, uh, a, a political figure, really, uh, named David Johnson, who was, when he wrote the book, published it in 2012, uh, was Deputy Attorney General of Virginia um, when Ken Cuccinelli was Attorney General of Virginia. And um, David Johnson, who just got a new book out on Judge Spencer Roan, who was another a uh, pretty uncompromising old Republican in Randolph's generation. Um, David Johnson uh, feels that Randolph is a virtual hero. Um, his uh, chapter on slavery is the shortest in the book. It, I, it um, doesn't really get into it very much. Uh, he, uh, he describes uh, uh, John Randolph as uh, an, an exemplar of, um, of uh, pu uh, pure defense of personal liberty, and that what Randolph opposed was all good because what he was opposing was the the birth of what would become the welfare state. Okay, well, uh, that's that's an argument, and uh, but I I don't share that. I I I see Randolph as endlessly fascinating, uh, but endlessly unhelpful in um, moving, uh, in producing progress for the United States and the human race. I, and a lot of people who agreed with a lot of his politics, but who were willing to make compromises um, agreed that Randolph was more of a hindrance than a help. Does that sort of answer your question or a little bit? Yes, very much. And I am very excited for your book. I can't wait to get a copy. A science well, that, probably. that makes two of us. I can't wait to get it to. And I'll have more time for it now. We're, we're proud of many of our former students in the history department. 
I'm proud of many people who didn't go through the history department or just took a course or two on you. So uh, it's not an, ex an all inclusive list, um, but um, a, a former student of mine named Vanessa Holden, who did her, um, who did her um, senior paper as a history major on female resistance to slavery, um, just is having a book come out um, later this month uh, called um, oh, Surviving Southampton, meaning Southampton County. And it's about women, white and black, and the Nat Turner Rebellion. Um, she uh, she um, is a professor at the University of Kentucky now. I, Duana Waugh, another one of our uh, graduates in history, is teaching American history at Sweetbriar College now. Uh, Abigail Gautreau, Abby Gautreau has been at many um, uh, historic sites, mainly in Tennessee, uh, uh, and I think I think Alabama as well. Uh, you, uh, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. We're, uh, and then of course I can be proud of you even if you don't go into history. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've, um, I've had so many students who have enriched my life as well as my work that um, it's humbling to think about and several of them are here right now. Special. Leah, you had a, a question. My question doesn't relate to the lecture at all. I was going to ask what you're going to do when, uh, when you retire. There you go. Uh, it, it, you tailed off, but I think you asked what I was going to do in my retirement. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to sleep a little more, on it, but more than that, I'm I'm going to try to I am going to finish the the history of Virginia, and I have a couple of other uh, shorter uh, books that I want to produce in the next few few years. Um, I I don't want to jinx it, so I won't, I won't mention the the subjects. But one is a, a local history thing in in Virginia about a hundred years ago. And uh, another is a subject totally different, a transnational subject that involves something everybody's heard of, but um, they, it, it needs a little, uh, a little more love. So I'm going to do that too. And I want to travel more once the pandemic allows us to travel as we did before, if that's possible in the rest of my life. Um, I, I um, am, I think, happiest when I'm traveling and seeing something that I hadn't seen before. So I want to do more of that. With my wife, um, who I think is here, though I can't, I can only see a few of you. Um, Kathleen Placidi, sorry, Placidi is there with the hat on and that is his wife. Oh, oh good. Okay. Yeah, there you are next to him now. Hi, Kathleen. That's great. And Kathleen, teaches, you don't teach, she works at Sweetbriar. Right, and she has, she's an art historian who has taught mm -hmm. here actually, and has taught at several places, but is is now doing the doing God's work at Sweetbriar, which is fundraising, uh, the thing that small colleges need the most right now. But they, they are both very generous with their time, um, with our alums, both of them. Well, Kathleen did a wonderful series last summer and uh, with the mayor and, um, Many of us were on that. Um, it, was, it was terrific. It was terrific. We're very fortunate to have you both. And and let me say that those of you who um, who passed through my life um, in the last forty one years, um, if if you have the time, uh, if the spirit moves you, send me an email and let me know what you're doing now. I'd love to. I'd love to hear what you're doing. That's nice. Great idea. Our professors are wonderful about keeping in touch with their students, their former students. Well, I think we better wrap up. I bet some folks are hungry. <laughs> this has just been great. And John, just, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us. Um, and the, the work you put into it, it was really interesting. And oh, Okay, Sarah says, by far, P Professor Dontremont was one of my favorites at Randolph, and he will be missed in the classroom. And like I say, you have a lot of fans, to say the least. But thank you very, very much, and um, I wish you all well, and thanks for joining us today. Take good care.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.